This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. So we've looked at generic strategies and we've looked at strategic direction, like going into a new market or a new product. Now we have to look at how the strategic directions might possibly be achieved. And the first two methods we're going to be looking at is merger and acquisition and then organic growth. So merger and acquisition where one company takes over another company to form a larger group. And organic growth is where you reinvest profits or indeed raise more capital yourself and start up the other enterprise. And the way we're going to tackle this is just to look at the differences between some of the characteristics of merger and acquisition and organic growth. So what I'll do is I'll put uh, over here uh, merger and acquisition and here organic growth. And we'll just look at a, a couple of the characteristics. I'll, I'll call them characteristics rather than advantages and disadvantages uh, because sometimes it's not altogether clear to know which is which. The first one I'll look at is speed. So you want to get into a new country quickly or want to launch perhaps a new product range quickly, then fairly obviously merger and acquisition is going to be relatively fast. You can take over a company which is already in the country or a, a company which has already got the product range you want and you're kind of instantly there. Whereas organic growth is going to take some time to grow your market in the country or maybe to develop the product. So this is slow. Second uh, element we can look at, or characteristic we can uh, look at uh, here, is need for capital. And uh, fairly obviously, merger and acquisition requires immediate capital, either cash or the issue of shares, uh, to acquire the company. Whereas organic growth could be funded by retained profits, that might be a little bit slow, uh, but it can be often spread over a, a number of years, even if you're raising external capital. So this is uh, fairly uh, immediate, uh, whereas perhaps this one is more gradual. Third element that we'll look at is uh, risk. This gets uh, slightly more interesting. Which method of expansion has got the greater risk? Uh, merger and acquisition or organic growth? Well, with merger and acquisition, always remember that a seller has more information than a buyer. The seller of a second-hand car knows more about its defects than the buyer is ever likely to, to find. And there have been many mergers where the a company that's been taken over turns out to be a bit of a disappointment uh, for the buyer. It's not indicative of fraud necessarily, it's just the buyer will talk it up and the uh, the seller will talk it up and the buyer maybe pays a little bit too much. So there's certainly risk here that you end up with a, a company which uh, has actually got less in it than you thought and occasionally there have been mergers and acquisitions where the company that's been taken over has been discovered to be really an out and out fraud with very little in it. Organic growth is not without risk. If you're going into a new country and you decide to do it on your own without any prior experience, then really going to learn by your mistakes. Uh, similarly, if you decide to develop a new product really from scratch, there are a lot of uh, missteps you can take within that. So organic growth has got substantial risks as well. The different risks but nevertheless they are substantial. Cost. Well, if you buy a company which is already running, assuming a successful company, you're going to be paying here for goodwill. There's nothing wrong with paying for goodwill. Goodwill gives you access to additional profits uh, because of, for example, the reputation of the, com the company. Uh, but you have to be careful that uh, the valuation of goodwill is reasonable and you can get into a kind of bidding war if there's another potential purchaser there and it gets very kind of macho and nobody wants to give way and you can end up uh, paying too high a cost. 
Organic growth is probably the cheapest way. Uh, leaving aside, of course, the risk uh, characteristic here, but eventually, essentially, you are buying uh, assets, non-current assets at cost price. Uh, although you have to wait then for a while and hope uh, that the profits of the company are going to, you know, maintain that the uh, the, the amount you paid to develop this product uh, ends up with basically a positive net present value. The final element I will uh, put in here is disruption. Mergers and acquisition tend to be highly disruptive. Uh, personnel, the employees uh, feel very nervous because they know that generally after some sort of merger and acquisition uh, there's very often redundancies. Even if there's not redundancies, they're going to be maybe subject to a different boss. They're going to have to get used to different working styles. Maybe their job will change. And uh, many people, if they can, get so unsettled by merger and acquisition, they will leave. And very often it's the best people who leave. Uh, generally speaking, uh, people will say that disruption in a merger and acquisition is likely to last about one year. I, in my life, have been through two mergers and acquisitions where the company I worked for was taken over. The first one I stayed, uh, and the second one I decided that I didn't want to go through this process again, uh, and I left. However, organic growth has almost no disruption at all. What you see in organic growth is your, your company is expanding, it's opening new branches uh, and so on, and you see really opportunities open up as the business expands. And you think to yourself, if it keeps expanding, maybe in a year or two years time, I could be in a managerial position in that new branch. It tends to be in merger and acquisition, you have the feeling that maybe opportunities close in, that maybe a manager from another company comes in above you, taking the job which you expected to, to have. Other methods of growth. Uh, first of all, joint ventures. Uh, joint venture happens where you have company A, company B, and what they do is they produce a joint venture company. And what they do is they put into this uh, some capital uh, they may transfer assets, they may transfer human resources, they may also transfer know-how. Joint ventures are very popular for large complex projects. One of the most successful joint ventures in the last 25-30 uh, years was Airbus. Airbus was set up as a, uh, an organisation to uh, produce a new range of civil aircraft really to challenge Boeing which had a very uh, uh, dominant position in the market and if you think about it you know one company to take the risk and the gamble of designing and selling a new range of civil aircraft it's going to be very expensive for that company a lot of risk of this didn't work that would maybe ruin the company a lot of expertise and skills needed in that perhaps too much for one company. And what happened was four European aerospace companies joined together in a joint venture to develop the Airbus. It proved very successful. And then what they had to have was an exit strategy. How do these joint ventures get their money out? And the way it was done with the uh, Airbus was it was uh, floated on a stock exchange and people who wanted out could get out. Very popular for these large, complex, risky projects. What you need to make sure is every avenue of uh, contention is covered. What happens if you feel somebody's not pulling their weight, not putting in the right know-how? Uh, what happens if somebody wants to leave early? Maybe other financial pressures uh, say that they have to leave. How are the profits going to be shared at the end? Uh, it's a bit like marriage where people might uh, suggest you need a prenuptial agreement. Uh, to specify how the assets are going to be split up if uh, the thing comes to grief. Licensing. Licensing is a very low risk way of expanding abroad. 
basically what you do is you allow somebody else to use a process or maybe a brand it's very popular for example in Europe uh, to license the manufacture of beer uh, beer is essentially uh, pretty much water and if you think about it there's not much point in making beer uh, perhaps in Belgium uh, putting it into a boat sailing water across water and uh, then distributing it perhaps in the UK so what a foreign beer company can do is to license a UK company to make it to their specifications and then allow them to brand it you can get similar things in the manufacture of coca-cola coca-cola concentrate is transported to the other country uh, and then essentially the the coca-cola is bottled and sold by a uh, licensed uh, company what happens is the licensor the coca-cola or the original brewery they take a royalty so you can get this very international kind of distribution without having to set up factories and your own distribution centers in foreign countries which is where a lot of the risk is what you do is you let somebody else do it and you take the royalty and it's relatively risk-free provided they make your product to the right specifications franchises uh, franchises are a bit like uh, licensing but rather more hands-on I suppose so let's uh, take the example of McDonald's so that McDonald's a hamburger uh, chain uh, and let's say that I had a long-standing ambition uh, to run a hamburger shop so here we have uh, myself now obviously I could set up a hamburger outlet on my own and put above the door Ken's Burgers or something of that sort but that's not going to have a great market presence nobody's ever heard of that before there's a lot of risk involved therefore so what I do is I approach McDonald's and say I would like to run a hamburger shop can I be a franchisee of you McDonald's is a franchisor I am the franchisee and they will kind of size me up and so on and if I pass their various uh, kind of uh, uh, scrutinies then what I will do is I will buy into the franchise that's worth me buying in because the risk is much lower the chance of a McDonald's franchise not working is actually fairly low because they've got great expertise and where to set it up and how to run it and then they will provide me with the following typically they will provide me with some uh, help assistance you know where to set it up not too close to other uh, places you want a good passing traffic and uh, so on they will uh, also provide some training they provide some raw materials they will provide some research and development so that new products are going to be developed kind of centrally I don't have to, to, to pay for that they will provide some marketing so if McDonald's can advertise on television I as just Ken's Burgers on my own couldn't possibly afford that sort of advertising note that they provide me with raw materials they will normally say you can only buy raw materials from us and there's another stream here of money going from me to McDonald's I will not be permitted to go to cheaper suppliers and source my own raw materials and also what they give in a very big way is going to be rules it's McDonald's interest to try and make sure that each one of their outlets follows a set of very very well specified rules so that all McDonald's outlets effectively are the same they will specify when there are special offers on they will specify when the opening time should be they will specify how long the waiting time should be to be served and so on and this is where very often franchises break down a little bit I thought I was setting up my own hamburger shop under the the guidance of McDonald's but actually maybe what I discover is I'm not much different to an employee however it allows McDonald's to get cash up front it, as it expands it gets some of the upfront cash here it allows McDonald's to keep a very very lean head office 
if I find out on Monday morning that somebody has broken a window on a Sunday evening, I don't ring up McDonald's repairs and maintenance. I have to find the glass repairman myself. So the, the head office is kept very, very lean. And the final bite of the cherry they get is very often the royalty. I'm not saying that I'm not saying McDonald's is exactly like this, but these are the, the typical three flows of cash the franchisor gets. People have to buy in, then they have to pay for the uh, raw materials uh, and so on at a price dictated by the franchisor. And then there's a royalty based on either profit or revenue. And you can be sure that these uh, payments are arranged uh, to make, uh, well, some incentive for me, but probably not enough to, to make me fantastically rich. But it's a very, very popular way of international expansion. Many retail outlets work on a franchise model. Finally, we have strategic alliances. This is a very kind of loose arrangement, really, to cooperate. Uh, and a good example are the airline uh, strategic alliances, and indeed the one is called Star Alliance. Uh, Star Alliance has got Lufthansa and uh, some of the uh, Asian uh, uh, airlines in it. It's got some of the Americans one in it. I think it's got Air New Zealand in it and so on. And by a kind of cooperation that you're getting here, uh, then you can effectively service the world. Whereas if you were just Air New Zealand, for example, your route network is going to be very con constrained indeed. So a strategic alliance, there's no co-ownership of anything of that sort. It is an agreement to cooperate so that all parties to the alliance can present a better service to the public. The last uh, section in this uh, chapter deals with something called portfolio management. Uh, and portfolio management uh, really deals with the relationship between head office and its various subsidiaries. How should the head office manage these subsidiaries? And there are three ways. First of all, uh, there is what's known as portfolio managers. And portfolio managers uh, is very much the way in which you would manage a personal portfolio of shares. So let's say you had uh, five different sorts of shares. Maybe you had Sainsbury's, British Aerospace, British Airways, Marks and Spencer's, GKN, you know, five listed companies. The only thing that you can do as a private investor is to decide whether they are doing well enough for you to keep them or whether you want to get rid of them. You cannot interfere with the day-to-day -day management of these investments. You have to be inevitably very hands-off. And this is what happens in a, in a group where the attitude is portfolio management. Although, obviously, the holding company could interfere with the management of the subsidiaries, it chooses not to. What it does is it gives these subsidiaries targets, profitability, earnings per share, return on capital employed, all sorts of financial targets. And if the subsidiary hits those targets, then all is well. If the subsidiary doesn't hit those targets, then it may remove the management, replace them, or may decide that I don't want the subsidiary in my group at all. So it's very, very much hands off. The second one is uh, synergy managers. Synergy managers is where there's a kind of mind really behind the construction of the group. And what you have is, uh, is a deliberate ploy or policy really of constructing the group uh, so that we get synergy. We save costs so we can increase revenue by, because they're together. An example might be uh, a company which, for example, one of them sells solar panels And another quite separate company uh, sells what I will call double glazing. For those of you who don't know, double glazing is a window with two sheets of glass, which provides very good thermal and indeed sometimes noise insulation. So these are two separate companies, but think how well they might do if they were to merge. Because then what you could do is you could say, well, people are interested in saving heat. 
uh, generating their own electricity from the sun and so on. There's a kind of ecological uh, impetus there. Uh, what these people could do is they could offer maybe a deal. If you replace your windows with the double glazing and you get solar panels, then maybe you save 25%. Or they have a customer lists. These are all the people who bought solar panels last year. What about writing to them and say, seeing whether or not they want to invest in double glazing? So this is a real mind, a real kind of strategy behind these to make use of synergy. And the final type of portfolio manager is called the parental developers. This is the, the more complicated one. This is where holding office, uh, holding a company really takes the uh, place of like a parent and has got a relatively young, small, inexperienced subsidiary which it will help as a parent would to a child. Now to see how this would work, we need to go to the next slide. And this Ashridge portfolio display here, this is to do with parental development. And I'll describe it first in terms of people with their children. And then we'll we'll describe how it would actually work maybe in a in a more you know, proper uh, business kind of uh, environment. So what we have here, don't worry too much about the writing at the top of the uh, the screen. Uh, but what we have here is we have along the bottom here we have benefit, and benefit is really saying how much could the young subsidiary or the young person benefit be from being helped by someone more experienced. Up the side we have feel and this is how much the parent or the holding company uh, actually understands what help the subsidiary or the child needs. So if you're going to get really high return on this, uh, the child must need help and the parent must be able to provide the right help. So for example, when my children were young, they needed help reading. I can read. So what I could do is I could go through reading books at night with them, pointing to the words and so on, and I could get them to read out and I could read while they, whilst they watched and so on. Uh, that was great. That, that really benefited these people uh, because they needed help with reading and I could provide that help. Now my children are grown up, they read perfectly well. Uh, the, the first example was this Heartland business where it could really help them. Now they are grown up. They don't need help reading. There is no benefit to be given to them anymore by going through books in the evening and so on. I can still read them but it's not going to do any good. They're not going to get any better. They're not going to get any worse. Uh, but it, but it's a kind of standstill. It's a kind of waste of time because you don't need the benefit. Moving down uh, here. Again, going back to my children when they were young, uh, we wanted them to learn piano. So they needed help, you know, knowing where the notes were, scales, etc., etc. No point in me trying to do that. I don't play the piano uh, and although I might try to sit down with them and try to point out the notes and so on here, my feel, my ability to actually help them was severely limited and I might have been doing damage. What they needed for help was my wife who plays the piano and she could have provided the, the right help and it would be more a heartland business. And it's called value trap because you maybe feel you can help uh, and you try to help but actually you're providing the wrong sort of help, you're actually potentially doing damage. And finally we have alien businesses here. This would be like if my children could now play the piano well uh, and I had the presumption to try to correct them or, 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 or to improve playing the piano. Not only do they not need help, uh, but they're getting useless advice from entirely the wrong person uh, and this is likely to alienate them considerably. So that was a kind of family explanation of what was going on uh, within that. Let's uh, put it into then a, a kind of a business context uh, and see what was happening. 
And, and let's say that the holding company is a company called GlaxoSmithKline. So GlaxoSmithKline, or KGSK, is a, a very large, successful international pharmaceuticals company. And what uh, pharmaceuticals companies are particularly good at is research and development, uh, drug trials, that's necessary to make sure the drug actually works and that it doesn't do any damage, and they're very good at marketing. Because the price, the cost of developing drugs is huge, they have to be able to market these in really on a worldwide basis to, to cover their costs. So those are the three things that Glaxo is very good at. This, this is potentially areas that it could help another company in. Let's see, uh, say that one of the companies it discovers is a small biotech company. So a small company, perhaps a spin-off from a local university, has discovered a worthwhile drug. It has done the research and development. But almost certainly what this small company will not be able to do is to carry out the clinical trials. These can go on for five to ten years and they are immensely expensive to run. And almost certainly this small biotech company will know nothing about marketing and certainly nothing about international marketing. Now this would be the perfect target for Dlaxo to take over. The company has got the discovery, now it needs help in performing the clinical trials and then carrying out the marketing. That would be very much heartland business. Secondly, uh, let's say uh, GlaxoSmithKline is looking at uh, AstraZeneca. So AstraZeneca, another very large, successful international pharmaceuticals company, but uh, AstraZeneca doesn't need help. AstraZeneca is good at research and development, knows all about clinical trials, and is very good at international marketing. And if Glaxo, they understand each other perfectly, uh, but if Glaxo were to take over or merge with AstraZeneca, then you're getting a bit of a balanced, balanced business. You won't necessarily be doing any harm, uh, but the two together will not do maybe significantly better than the two apart. So it's a bit of a waste of time. Then let's say Glax is looking around for little investments and then so on. It discovers a little company, maybe this had to be some years ago. It was called Rovio. And you may or may not know the, the name Rovio, uh, but Rovio was the uh, computer game company which uh, invented a game called Angry Birds, which, which is a great way of wasting time. Finnish company. And you can imagine that Rovio had a invented, done the research and developing, and it had developed a nice little game, uh, but I don't think it would need probably clinical trials, but knew nothing about marketing that internationally. And you get Glaxo coming along saying, we know about marketing, we will uh, take you on, we will teach you about marketing. And that is a value trap business. Rovio does need help in marketing, but it doesn't need help in marketing, the sort of things Glaxo knows about. Glaxo knows about marketing pharmaceuticals, it knows nothing really about marketing computer games. And the final example might be that Laxo looks around and sees Nintendo. Uh, another uh, company in the computer game market, but a very large successful company in the computer game uh, market. Not only does Nintendo not need much help in marketing, uh, but Glaxo doesn't know anything about marketing Nintendo Wii's and computer games and so on. This is very much the alien business. It's completely inappropriate for Glaxo to take over Nintendo, which doesn't need help, uh, and about which Glaxo needs nothing, knows nothing, and can provide no benefit, therefore, uh, to Nintendo whatsoever.